was not fired because of Hillary. Comey was fired because of the Russians. That shows that we have a deeply insecure president who understands that the noose is tightening because of this Russia investigation. President Donald Trump provided strong and decisive leadership to restore the trust and confidence of the American people in the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I just want somebody that's competent. I am a big fan of the FBI. I love the FBI. It's time to make America great again. Join the movement. The Neil A. Caruso Show. Show. Time to dream big. Informative, insightful, and valiant leadership. Telling it the way it is to make a difference. Good afternoon and happy Mother's Day out there to all the loving moms and my mother as well. Happy Mother's Day and welcome to the Neil A. Caruso Show, a jam-packed program today. In fact, there's so much to cover that we're going to go an hour and a half today, right until 1.30, so don't go anywhere. A whole lot to get to, and of course, the big story this week that everyone is covering is FBI Director James Comey is now the ex-FBI Director. President Trump fired him on it Tuesday, and we're going to tell you the real story of Comey's firing and Call me the political actor as well, and that's the topic of our Caruso's Commons monologue. So if you're watching the media, you're not getting the full story. You're getting a debate about ice cream. In fact, how many scoops did President Trump have at the White House? That's real. That's not fake news. Sadly, that is a real story. So we're going to tell you the real story behind James Comey's firing, and it's about Drain the Swamp. Now, the president, let's be totally upfront and honest, has the constitutional authority to fire the FBI director, as he does with other appointees, not the courts, but other appointees. So let's be real about that. The president has the authority to fire the FBI director. Now, earlier this week, he received a letter from his deputy uh, attorney general, Rod Rosenstein, and he sent a letter himself to FBI director James Comey. Now, was a little hasty, possibly, in sending out the letter, um, but when you have a communication that has to come out, uh, to the FBI director, and they didn't want any anything to be leaked. It seemed like the former FBI director, James Comey, found out through the media. But regardless, it was done in a letter that it received from his deputy attorney general that was confirmed by the Senate, Rod Rosenstein, 94 to 6. Now, Rosenstein is a career government official. He started with the Justice Department's public integrity section in 1990 under George H.W. Bush. He worked for Bill Clinton, and he worked for George W. Bush. In fact, he was the only U.S. attorney appointed by a previous administration to last all eight years with the Obama administration. So Rosenstein is someone who is really not political and is enforcing the law, which is, remember, President Trump is the law and order candidate. Now, President Trump tweeted this on Friday morning, further adding to the whole James Comey saga. He said, President Comey better hope that there are no tapes of our conversations before he starts leaking to the press. Now, could Comey be someone who is leaking? Well, possibly, and we'll cover that in a second. But the tapes, if you notice, are in quotes, similar to how the wiretapping tweet was in quotes, and more on unmasking in this monologue because it all relates. Now, the tapes that exist, well, could it really be a physical tape? Possibly. But... What's more likely is that everything that the president does is documented, whether it be by the press or his team. President Trump is never alone. So if he has dinner, as President Trump revealed to NBC on Thursday, if he has dinner with James Comey, he has his staffers around as well, and FBI staffers in the area, uh, who are listening and will probably very well documenting what is going on in the dinner. So President Trump is giving a heads up to James Comey, saying... Don't leak anything because we know what the truth is. Now, let's talk about James Comey. He's a political actor and really always has been through his term. So let's go through what James Comey has done uh, through his term as FBI director. 
appointed by Obama. In 2014, he publicly contradicted Obama about the role of government. Obama had defended big government at an Ohio State University commencement. Now, in 2015, Obama said that he's making great progress with ISIS, but Comey testified that ISIS has a fighting force working to develop a caliphate and will come in through open borders. Now, obviously, I do agree with Comey, and I trust his opinion on this. And there are some things that you may agree with Comey, you may agree with Obama. The point is, as an FBI director, you cannot insert yourself into politics. You cannot publicly contradict the man that you are representing. Uh, you serve as, at the pleasure of the president. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree with him, because there needs to be separation of powers, for sure. There needs to be, you need to be independent. But at the same time, you don't publicly contradict yourself. Go back to the list. Obama uh, said that, uh, or Comey said that Obama's law enforcement scrutiny made police less aggressive and ineffective. Comey wants to write an op-ed last summer on the Russian interference and Comey had relied on a discredited dossier to obtain a FISA warrant on the Trump campaign, which relates to the unmasking. And of course, that dossier that was revealed to President Trump in a meeting at Trump Tower last summer when he was then President-elect Trump, well, somehow the dossier got leaked to the media and the inner communications of the meeting and how Trump reacted. There were only a few people in the room with President Trump at the time. It was FBI Director, now former FBI Director James Comey, DNI, former Director of National Intelligence James Clapper, the NSA Director Mike Rogers um, were in the room, and the CIA, CIA Director under Obama, John Brennan. So one of those men leaked the dossier meeting with Trump to the media. Could it be Comey? Who knows? Now, of course, you have all the debacle about the Hillary Clinton investigation. So let's take a look at that timeline. In August 2015, it began when the FBI confirmed that it was investigating Hillary Clinton. Then in July, July 1, Loretta Lynch met with Bill Clinton on the Phoenix airport tarmac, hampering the investigation. Lynch said that she would not recuse herself and would therefore accept the recommendations of the FBI. July 2nd, over a holiday weekend, Clinton was interviewed by the FBI off the record for three and a half hours, no record of the meeting. That's unprecedented. Only FBI notes. And then July 5th, Comey gave a news conference, laying out Clinton's committed crimes, but saying he would not prosecute, saying that it was extremely careless, instead of the legal standard of gross negligence, and said over and beyond his role as FBI director, Comey said, no reasonable prosecutor would take the case. Take a look. I'm here to give you an update on the FBI's investigation of Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email system during her time as Secretary of State. I opted for convenience to use my personal email account, which was allowed. They were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive, highly classified information. I thought it would be easier to carry just one device. She also used numerous mobile devices to send and to read email. We went through a thorough process to identify all of my work-related emails. The lawyers doing the sorting for Secretary Clinton in 2014 did not individually read the content of all of her emails. And deliver them to the State Department. It's highly likely that their search missed some work-related emails. So that the emails were immediately captured and preserved. There was no archiving at all of her emails. That was uh, my obligation. I fully fulfilled it. They deleted all emails they did not produce to state, and the lawyers then cleaned their devices in such a way as to preclude complete forensic recovery. There were no security breaches. It is possible that hostile actors gained access. There is no classified materials. 110 emails contain classified information at the time they were sent or received. I'm certainly well aware uh, of the uh, classification uh, requirements and uh, did not uh, send classified material. Even if information is not marked classified in an email, Participants who know or should know that the subject matter is classified are still obligated to protect it. At the time, this didn't seem like an issue. None of these emails showed any kind of unclassified system. So laying out basically the cases of all the criminality that Hillary Clinton committed and then saying no reasonable prosecutor would take the case? Really? Trey Gowdy even said I'd take the case. Now let's go back to the timeline because then the next day, 
Lynch accepted the FBI's recommendation not to charge Clinton. Of course, Lynch wanted the job as attorney general under Hillary if she became president. Comey testified multiple times. And then he wrote a memo in September that was leaked, of course, to his employees defending his recommendation. Later in September on the 28th, Comey testified, defended his decision not to charge Clinton. One month later, Comey announced that new emails have been discovered on the laptop of former New York representative, the pervert Anthony Weiner. And that's, of course, the husband, or now former husband, of Uma Abedin, uh, a Clinton aide. November 6, Comey wrote a letter to Congress that was leaked. So you see the illegal leaking that goes on in this process, saying he would not prosecute Clinton. Then May 3rd, 2017, so just this past week, or last week, Comey testified that hundreds of thousands of emails had ended up on Anthony Weiner's laptop. They were forwarded from Uma Abedin. Then later, on May 9th, well, the FBI said he lied under oath that was misleading. So then he was terminated that same day by President Trump. So you just see the political machinations that are going on in Washington as it relates to this former FBI director. Trump shouldn't have fired him. Now, the Democrats and Clinton, well, they despise Comey. Let's be honest about it. But they blame the election on Comey, and still they're going to support him. Take a look at this. It wasn't a perfect campaign. There is no such thing. Um, but I was on the way to winning until the combination of Jim Comey's letter on October 28th and Russian WikiLeaks raised doubts in the minds of people who were inclined to vote for me but got scared off. And the evidence for that intervening uh, event is, I think, um, compelling, persuasive. Uh, and so we overcame a lot in the campaign. We overcame an enormous uh, uh, barrage of negativity, of false equivalency, and so much else. Um, but as Nate Silver, who I, you know doesn't work for me, he's an independent uh, analyst, but one considered to be uh, very reliable, you know, has concluded you know, if the election been on October 27th, I'd be your president. Were you a victim of misogyny? And why do you think you lost the majority of the white female vote? Just to give you a tiny little preview, uh, yes, I do think it played a role. I think other things did as well. Every day that goes by, we learn more about uh, some of the uh, unprecedented interference, including from a foreign power whose leader uh, is not a member of my fan club. And so I think... It is, a, it is real. It is uh, very much a part of the um, landscape politically and socially and economically. So Hillary Clinton blames Comey. She blames misogyny. What else is she going to blame? She has no one to blame but herself for using a private legal server in the first place and running a corrupt foundation as well. And we could go on and on. And the access that she gave to countries who, you know, they kill Christians and Jews, and they also enslave women. But she's taking money from them. So here's another example of the phony moral outrage from Democrats. All I can tell you is the FBI director has no credibility. You said that he had no credibility. I assume that you support the president's decision then to fire his FBI director. No, I do not necessarily support the president's decision. The president ought to fire Comey immediately. And this is a direct attack on the democracy in the United States. I, have, I just have no way of understanding these actions. They're, they're completely unprecedented, and that's why I think he owes the American public more information. I was stunned, and I'll say I think we're living through the stress test of this 230-year-old democracy. And if you're going to violate DOG, G, DOJ policy, you need a darn good reason for it, and you better have something to say. Uh, and here, there wasn't a good reason for it, and he had nothing to say. This letter just uh, raised far more questions than any could answer. Well, it's incredibly disturbing uh, at many levels. I, uh, I am worried about the integrity of the FBI. Suddenly, there is what I call a hocus-pocus move. Uh, hmm. We then move to another subject. Um, and this one is, without a doubt, not only explosive, but I think it also goes to the heart of our democracy. So if Hillary Clinton had won the White House, would you have recommended that she fire FBI Director James Comey? Well, let me tell you something. 
If she had won the White House, I believe that given what he did to her and what he tried to do, she should have fired him. Yes. So she should have fired him, but he shouldn't have fired him. This is why I'm confused. She so because Trump fired Comey, here's the phony moral outrage on the left. And the acting FBI director, Andrew McCabe, on the Russia collusion, well, it just doesn't hold much weight. You know, people think that President Trump is only fired the FBI director because he wants to put this Russia investigation to an end. It's quite to the contrary. He just wants to speed up the investigation. Let's not have all the political madness over. It shouldn't be a political issue. Now, obviously, the Democrats feel differently. But let's get to the heart of the issue and get to it quickly. Get to a thorough investigation. But let's not let this drag on forever. And a demoralized and scrutinized FBI you know that they had a, a, a morality issue, and they really just want to move on and get this investigation done without being in the public eye. Now, President Trump said that he would give the FBI director a chance if I didn't fire him at noon on January 20th. He said he would give him a chance, but in his heart he knew he would fire James Cohn. Was it a mistake not to ask Jim Comey to step down from the, uh, the FBI at the outset of your presidency? Is it too late now to ask him to step down? No, it's not too late, but, you know, I have confidence in him. We'll see what happens. You know, it's, it's going to be interesting. Don't forget, when Jim Comey came out, he saved Hillary Clinton. People don't realize that. He saved her life because I call it Comey won. And I joke about it a little bit. When he was reading those charges, she was guilty on every charge. And then he said... She was essentially okay. Director well, that's Comey, why I'm, I'm asking. Why is he no, still No, I'm just the saying, well, because I want to give everybody a good, fair chance. Director Comey was very, very good to Hillary Clinton, that I can tell you. If he weren't, she would be right now going to trial. Look, he's a showboat. He's a grandstander. The FBI has been in turmoil. You I was going to fire Comey, my decision. It was not. You had made the decision before they came in. The I, room. I was going to fire Comey. Uh, I, there's no good time to do it, by the way. Uh, they, because in your letter, they you said I, I accepted, accepted their recommendation. Yeah, well, they so you also, had already made the decision. Oh, I, I was going to fire regardless of recommendation. So there was they, really room. He made a recommendation. He's highly respected. Very good guy. Very smart guy. Uh, the Democrats like him, the Republicans <clears throat> like him. Uh, he made a recommendation. But regardless of recommendation, I was going to fire Comey. Knowing there was no good time to do it. And in fact, when I decided to just do it, I said to myself, I said, you know, this Russia thing with Trump and Russia is a made-up story. It's an excuse by the Democrats for having lost an election. Are you angry, theory, angry with Mr. Comey because of his Russia investigation? I just want somebody that's competent. I am a big fan of the FBI. I love the FBI. But were you a I fan of him, him of taking up that investigation? I think that about the Hillary Clinton investigation? No, about, about the Russia investigation and no, possible links between... Look, look, let me tell you. As far as I'm concerned, I want that thing to be absolutely done properly. When I did this now, I said, I probably, maybe, will confuse people. Maybe I'll expand that, you know, I'll lengthen the time because it should be over with. It should, in my opinion, should have been over with a long time ago because it, all it is is an excuse. But I said to myself, I might even lengthen out the investigation, but I have to do the right thing for the American people. He's the wrong man for that position. And there hasn't been any proof of collusion, at least not yet, of Russia and the Trump campaign. Uh, take it from the former director of national intelligence, James Clapper. 
Does intelligence exist that can definitively answer the following question, whether there were improper contacts between the Trump campaign and Russian officials? We did not include any evidence in our report, and I say our, that's NSA, FBI, and CIA with my office, the Director of National Intelligence, that had anything that had any reflection of collusion between members of the Trump campaign and the Russians. There was no evidence of that included in, in our report. I understand that, but does it exist? N not to my knowledge. If it existed, it would have been in it this could report. Have been, it, this could have unfolded uh, or become uh, uh, available in, in the time since I left the government. What, at but some at the time, I, we had no evidence of, of, of such collusion. Um, General Clapper, on March the 5th, 2017, you said the following to a question. Here's the question. Does intelligence exist that can definitely answer the following question? Where there were improper contacts between the Trump campaign and Russian officials, you said, we did not include any evidence in our report, and I say our, that's the NSA, the FBI, the CIA, with my office, the Director of National Intelligence, that had anything that had any reflection of collu collusion between members of the Trump campaign and the Russians. There was no evidence of that included in our report. Chuck Todd then asked, I understand that, but does it exist? You say, no, not to my knowledge. Is that still accurate? It is. So now the media on Wednesday, they spent 62% on all free evening news broadcasts covering the James Comey story and the fake Russia narrative that they're pushing. It just doesn't hold much weight when everyone says that there was no evidence of collusion. Now, for the proof of this, well, two Clinton insiders wrote a book called Shatter, and in it, there's an excerpt where they talk about the Russian narrative strategy. It was a strategy set within 24 hours of her concession speech. Now, of course, she didn't show up the night of the concession speech, but it was a pushed narrative. Now, on Russia, Okay, so while the media, you know, they call it Trump treasonous, that's the view, bring up Watergate, Dan Rather, in fact, tweeted and put on Facebook that it was one of his darkest weeks in America. The guy who pushed the fake news report about George W. Bush trying to get him not to win his re-election campaign. So I don't take much from Dan Rather. But on Russia, they've been meddling in our elections and, and elections throughout the world since the 1970s. Now, let's also be clear on this election. They did not change votes at the ballot. People did not vote for Trump because Russia told them to. It's kind of strange. But Russia has been meddling in elections or trying to influence elections like they just did in France. More on that later. And they tried to influence it since the 70s. We need to beef up our cybersecurity software. And that relates to this week. Because this week, there was a worldwide cyber attack. The numbers coming in this morning showing 200,000 victims in the cyber attack ransomware that came in through an email that people click on and it slows down your computer and mandates a ransom of about 300 to 600 dollars europe asia the u.s about 200 countries are saying about 150 countries they're saying this morning that number has changed affected by the cyber attack now trump signed an executive order this week to bolster government security and in and increase our cyber security software and infrastructure from cyber attacks including the electric grid and the financial sector. That is key, and a key part of the Trump agenda. Under the Obama administration, there were 12 major cyber attacks on the U.S., including the Office of Personnel Management, that put over 22 million Americans' personal information and identifications in danger of being hacked from foreign actors. Hillary Clinton's use of a private email server, well, you saw call me, said that, well, it was very well possible that foreign actors got a hold of it. So what does this come down to? Securing our infrastructure and making steps to improve our cybersecurity, not whining about losing an election because you used a private email server and committed illegalities, and really we found out rigged the primary election and got questions from a debate. Is Trump responsible for that? Um, now... Unmasking is another piece of this. I wrote a story about that uh, last month, and we find out this week an intelligence report saying that over 1,900 American identities were unmasked, which is very rare, supposedly very rare, in NSA surveillance last year. About 3,900 Americans were surveilled and having a conversation with a foreign actor. In 2015, over 2,000 
American identities were unmasked. Now, unmasking, if done illegally, and only 20 people at the NSA, about 20 people, can unmask or request to unmask names. Well, if that is illegally unmasked, the people asking for the unmasking, they go to prison for five years. It's a violation, a felony of the Espionage Act. Now, former National Security Advisor under Obama, Susan Rice, has denied any of this. Now, of course, she's the one that pushed the Benghazi lie and lied on five Sunday news shows, but she denies having been involved in it, but she refused to testify on Capitol Hill. And there are sources, multiple sources, from Bloomberg, from Fox News, and others saying that someone very high up in the Obama administration requested unmasked names gaining political intelligence on Donald Trump, surveilling a political adversary. Now, former Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, and former Attorney General, uh, former Deputy Attorney General, Sally Gates, well, they were asked about this on Capitol Hill. Take I want look. to discuss uh, unmasking. Uh, Mr. Clapper and Ms. Yates, uh, did either of you ever request the unmasking of Mr. Trump, his associates, or any member of Congress? Yes, in, in uh, one case I did. I can, I can specifically uh, recall, but I, I can't discuss it any further than that. You can't? So if I ask you for details, you said you can't discuss that? Is that what you said? Not, not here. Okay. Ms. Ye Ms. Yates, can you answer that question? Did you ever request unmasking of Mr. Trump, his associates, or any member of Congress? No. Uh, question two, did either of you ever review classified documents in which Mr. Trump, his associates, or members of Congress had been unmasked? Oh, yes. You have. Can you give us details here in this? No, department? I can't. Ms. Yates, have you? Yes, I have, and no, I can't give you details. Okay. Did either of you ever share information about en masse Trump associates or members of Congress with anyone else? Um, well, I'm thinking back over six and a half years, I could have discussed it with either my deputy or my general counsel. Okay. Ms. Yates? In the course of the Flynn matter, I had discussions with other members of the intel community. I'm not sure if that's responsive to your question. And in both cases, you can't give details here? No. No. So illegal unmasking potentially of Trump and his associates, that would be very damning and a damning precedent that that would set. And even Senator Rand Paul has said that he feels and has put forth a request to the Senate Intel Committee to investigate unmasking. He feels he was illegally surveilled, and he said that a senator as well has told him that he feels the same. So these are the issues that Americans should care about, especially if we are put and our lives are in danger in unmasking. That's it for Caruso's comments. Very important. When we come back, a former U.S. Marine on our national security as it relates to Europe and the terror threat. cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. 
DLA Crusoe tells you what you need to know. Opening up the dialogue. Straightforward talk that drives the political establishment crazy. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor. Period. What, like with a cloth or something? I don't know how it works digitally at all. <laughs> He's got the knack for it. The knack for America. Subscribe to the Neelay Caruso Show podcast on iTunes and log on to NeelayCaruso.com. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. And you'll say, please, please, it's too much winning. So today, the France election, well, Emmanuel Macron was officially sworn in as president of France. Last week, the election uh, took place, and, well, their decisions and their immigration policies do affect us here in our national security. And for that, we interviewed in a two-part interview. Here's part one of our interview with a former U.S. Marine, a pastor, and also author of Life in the Second Half. His name is David K. Jackson, and we sat down with him on Friday. Take a look. Pastor Jackson, thank you for taking the time this afternoon, and thank you for your service in the Marines. How are you today? Absolutely wonderful, Neil, and thank you for the opportunity. Best day of my life. How are you today, sir? I'm doing very well. Thank you for taking the time again. I know you're a very busy man, and um, you served at the U.S. Embassy in France. Um, we just got out of a uh, heated election in France, as well as, of course, here in the U.S., and a lot of um, omens kind of impacting both elections So I'm curious as to what your reaction was um, coming out of last week's election. Well, the the election was so eerily similar to what we what what we're dealing with even now in our country. And that um, there was uh, some. By the pen and and Macron and the people made that decision, but there were some discrepancies as to the outcome of the election. In other words, the ballots were torn and that was a, a provision in France that stated that if ballots were torn, they, they, they could not uh, be qualified to count as a vote. So therefore, a lot of the the votes that were directed, uh, intended for Le Pen wasn't, wasn't counted. And therefore, there's a controversy as to whether the legitimacy of the Macron uh, election. So what is the, what is the reaction over there? I know you're in Alabama today, but what is the reaction in France? I'm sure you've uh, spoken to people there in terms of uh, Macron winning ahead of um, ahead of Le Pen, is there a, a conspiracy theory going on? Well, I, you know, it, it, it is absolutely a conspiracy theory going on, and, and, a, and, a, and a, a very heavy buzz or undercurrent right now with uh, people that are dissatisfied because they feel that their votes were not counted or, or overlooked uh, because of the discrepancies that were done to the ballots. And so there, there are some moves being made now. And talking, speaking with friends that, that that still live there, they're saying that that it's just uh, right now about being patient and trying to maintain, you know, some semblance of unity for the country because there's so many other things that are going on in addition to the election, such as in our country. Right, and you know, right. Pastor Jackson it seems like the election of uh, Macron. That was really in favor of the status quo, and you know certainly the markets here benefited from that because they were talking about a, a massive decline in the market the following day if Marine Le Pen won. Now the big difference between the two candidates, of course, is on immigration and national security. Um, Le Pen has been compared to President Donald Trump in terms of um, closed borders. She does not favor the EU. Uh, Macron, of course, um, believes in a very strong. European Union, and it was a win for the EU, the election last week. Uh, what is your entire take on this? Well, as, as you stated, there was a, a split along party lines, it appeared, and, and, it, and it appears that those that were with uh, Le Pen were more were far right, as we would consider it in our country. And, and of course, Macron was considered the, the liberal of the, of the, of the left leaning candidate. And so with that split, uh, there was there was some um, ideas or, or or a mindset that were toward and leaning toward leaning in the direction of, of, of removing themselves away uh, from the uh, euro and, and and coming out of the European Union and so that that went away when when Macron as you stated uh, who was more you know uh, status quo the, the the more career politician for lack of a better term 
with him winning, it sort of eased the, the buzz of, of them uh, uh, pulling out of the uh, European Union. Now, you have a unique perspective because you were stationed at the U.S. Embassy in France. Um, tell me, when you were there, um, what was the sentiment? Because you've had a, a nationalist, populist wave, you know, extend from, uh, obviously, in Britain with uh, the Brexit last summer and in the U.S. with people saying, listen, we need to protect our country and take care of our own before we deal in terms of um, the rest of the world and, and global relations. What was it like there serving as a U.S. Marine re representing our country and dealing with people and understanding people there? Well, it was a very, very uh, interesting time, as you as you could re as you recall. There was um, a lot of a, a high spirit of, 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 of patriotism in the United States. We had just come out of the uh, uh, probably the more recent occurrence was the Beirut bombing. Uh, Jimmy Carter had just come out of office. President Reagan had only recently become president. So it was a very, very patriotic time. Uh, a, a lot similar to what we experience now, people were beginning to believe in America again, because, you know, we had gone through the hostage situation and on and on and on. And so when President Reagan entered office, and so by the time I arrived in Paris, there was a spirit of, you know, it, you could feel something in the air. Even in France around that time, uh, I had the fortune of being there when Vice President then uh, George Herbert Bush came to uh, France. And so it was a very, very uh, high spirited time, for lack of a better term, I suppose. And so now today, when you when you talk to people who are still in France, what's it like today? Is it similar to the U.S. in sentiment with uh, the Trump election? Or do you find that a lot of people are kind of, you know, relieved that Macron won? Well, you, I think it's uh, a lot similar to the U.S. in that. Uh, and the, the interesting thing here, I might remind you as well, and I might add, Neil, is that a third of the people did not even participate in the, in the electoral process. In other words, they didn't even vote. Right. And I thought that was I thought that was very, very interesting and, and kind of eerie in the sense that, uh, I, I, again, a lot like what we, we what we experienced in our most recent election. There were people that weren't uh, for Clinton and or President Trump. So you had a lot of people. I don't think we had a, nearly as many people that did not uh, participate in the political process. But there in France, they did. And I think that spoke to spoke volumes to a lot of people that there is a sense of uh, uh, disillusionment, uh, detachment from the political process. But yet at the same time, there are so many other underlying issues that are occurring. Remember, only recently we, we've had a, a, a terrorist attack. Yes that occurred almost back to back there in, in Paris alone. So I'm glad you brought that up because there are a lot of national security concerns and a lot of Americans, you know, a lot of Trump supporters who want to Marine Le Pen to win in favor of shutting down the EU effectively if she won. Since the Charlie Hebdo attack in 2015, there have been 11 attacks in France with 230 plus uh, people killed and 800 uh, plus wounded in France. Um, with that and with a lot of terror in the area, uh, a lot of um, radical Islamists going in through the border, um, what's it, you know, what's the, I don't want to say sentiment, but is there a lot of um, concern and, and worry there that the country isn't safe, that France is, you know, is um, seeing a decline in the way that uh, America has with a lot of uh, illegal immigration and President Trump here vowing to, you know, enforce the immigration laws and make sure that people here, um, you know, love the country and that we, you know, implement an extreme vetting process. Do you see a similar movement going on there? And how does the election impact that? Well, I think the, the election, again, sends, and this is my humble opinion, I think it sends a, a mixed signal and or, and or a wrong signal in that, uh, the liberal border border policies, the liberal immigration policies, even in our country, as we've noted over the probably last 15 to 20 years, are are coming back to haunt us. So we have to be careful. And I, I'm sure the, the Parisians, and I would remind you that there's a difference in the French and the Parisians, and they'll tell you that <laughs> almost immediately when you arrive there in the country. But the Parisians have, over the years, uh, it's been a very, very, it, it, it reminds you a lot of New York. In that it's a it's a melting pot 
and you have all nationalities, all, all types, all mindsets and all types of people. Uh, but I think over the years, a lot of people with ill intent have found Paris such a transient and, and, and tran transitional city. In other words, you could uh, go in, in five different directions from Paris and be in five to six different countries, you know, in, in no shorter time. And so they use Paris as sort of like a, a pivotal point to get to get to other countries. And from there, they leave Paris. And sometimes, as we as we've experienced only recently, uh, evil and, and, and negative uh, events are occurring in Paris as a result of some of the people that have liberally been allowed into that into the into the city. And, you know, as a, as a U.S. Marine, you know, someone who is there to protect our borders, protect our security and our freedom, for you personally, when you see, you know, people flowing across the border, there aren't um, many effective background checks, especially in the EU, which um, has been seen through uh, the, the Brexit process really was brought to the forefront about the uh, procedures in terms of letting people into the country. What does it do for you and your thought process when, you know, you're there protecting our freedom and you see another country and, and maybe ours to an effect that hasn't really been doing what they can from the political perspective? Well, I think now and, and, and during the time that we were posted there and I was in Paris for a year, worked at the, worked at the American embassy there in Paris for, for a year. And of course, we were considered the ambassadors. The first face that, that foreigners would see when they came to the embassy would be the face of Marine, of course. Right. And our job was to be that first line of defense uh, to protect the Americans. But when you found uh, other countries that did not uh, understand the need for security on the level that we as Americans uh, had it even there in France. And because of some of those uh, liberal policies and, and a lax sense of security, or, or, or lack, of re, lack of regard for the need uh, for security. We see now some of the things that are happening. And it's most amazing, Neil, even to sit here in America. And when I first uh, I separated from the Marine Corps, I'd only recently been on embassy duty. And when I arrived here in the States, I found it alarming some, how lax we were as a country. Now, fast forward 15, 25 years, 25 plus years later, we are now just now arriving at a point of of alertness, even a point of alertness that we operated on a daily basis in foreign countries. Uh, the, the, the security was we were always on alert, so to speak. We had to always be on guard because thing uh, again, the Beirut bombing, Beirut bombing comes to mind. Uh, the hostage situation in Beirut, Lebanon comes to mind. Sure. Those were more major events. Uh, you go to San Salvador, El Salvador, uh, they had a, a, a situation there in the embassy, and I can go on and on and on, name and occurrences of why in foreign countries we have to begin to prepare ourselves for people that have a desire, if they can make it onto our source, to do the exact same thing that they uh, inflicted, even in foreign countries. All right, part one of our interview with David K. Jackson, part two coming up. Let's get to our quote of the day. And the quote of the day comes from Scottish novelist Robert Louis Stevenson. Everyone who got to where he is has had to begin where he was. A good message for today. We'll be back in 90 seconds with part two of our interview with David K. Jackson on immigration and war on national security. See you night. Did you know dragging chains can spark a wildfire? Only you can prevent wildfires. Neely Crusoe is on the air. He's like a fine wine. Every day goes by, I get to appreciate his genius more and more. It's the Neely Crusoe Show podcast on iTunes and NeelyCaruso.com. It's a rhetoric. Things get lost in the rhetoric every day. Are not getting quality health care. Millennials here tell me that they're concerned with climate change. And His motto is simple. Be the best you. 
You always had that in the back of your mind for you to be the next one to be called up. But you should be voting based on the issues. The, the issues that I care about, that Trump cares about, that America cares about, are not necessarily the most glamorous. An all-American soccer star prepares for her pro career. And I trust our prosecutors in the field to make good judgments. They deserve to be unhandcuffed and not micromanaged from Washington. Rather, they must be permitted to apply the law to the facts of each investigation. Let's be clear. We are forcing the laws that Congress has passed. That is both our fundamental mission and our constitutional duty. Going forward, I have empowered our prosecutors to charge and pursue the most serious offense, as I believe the law requires, uh, most serious readily provable offense. It means that we're going to meet our responsibility to enforce the law with judgment and fairness. It is simply the right and moral thing to do. But it is important to note that unlike previous charging memoranda, I have given our prosecutors discretion to avoid sentences that would result in an injustice. As Attorney General Jeff Sessions of the Department of Justice on Friday, he signed a memo this week saying that they will pursue the most strenuous uh, sentences for uh, and for those who commit drug-related crimes, a big change from the Obama policies that label drug dealers as nonviolent offenders. You know, just think about that, selling heroin and opioids to your kids is not a violent, according to the Obama era, which has changed the law and order candidate and the law and order president and administration. Um, now, Obama commuted the sentences of roughly 1,680 federal drug offenders. Um, federal prisoners convicted of drug crimes, in terms of that, about half of those people are federal drug offenders that were uh, commuted the sentences, Obama commuted the sentences of them. Now, this opioid crisis, 91 deaths a day in the U.S. come from opioid um, overdoses. They come in prescription pills and heroin. We have a major heroin epidemic, and so the Trump administration is seeking to crack down on that. Now, in terms of gang violence, well, this week, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency arrested 1,378 suspected gang members, the most comprehensive six-week sweep that was completed. They targeted gang members, including the MS-13 gang, and associates in transnational criminal activity, including, but not limited to, murder and rape and sex trafficking and drug dealing. Uh, 993 of that over 1,300 people in the roundup on uh, this weekend, well, they were U.S. citizens, over 993 of those, and over 1,000 are confirmed uh, gang members. Now, also this week, the Texas governor, Greg Abbott, became the fourth governor of the state to sign uh, a law banning sanctuary cities, Florida and Louisiana could come next. Now, we talk about uh, some of the immigration policies, how it relates from Europe and France to the U.S. That is in part two of our interview with David K. Jackson. There has also been, you know, some anti-police sentiment there in Paris. Pull some stats on that that I wanted to ask you about. Um, six terror attacks in France on police, military, and security since 2015. Now, someone who is, you know, stationed there to protect people, you know, I'm sure you have a soft spot for um, the anti-police sentiment that is both in France and, and here in America. What's your opinion on that? And maybe you have some uh, insight into, you know, how what's going on in the minds of people who go after law enforcement? Is there is that a, a deeper problem than just the um, the face of, of terrorism that is coming into the country? Well, awesome question. Awesome question. And, and, and absolutely, yes, it is a deeper problem. I think, first of all, as Americans, we have to understand, and I share this with people all the time, uh, the bad guys, as we call them, or terrorists, if you should choose to, to, you know, to name them as such, right. um, they don't attack us because we're Democrat. They don't attack us because we're Republican. They don't attack us because we're black, you're Italian, white, or what have you. They attack us because we are American and the values that we represent. There are people that live in countries that uh, the, only, the only image or, or, or understanding that they have of Americans is propaganda. 
And so they're showing the negative. They're showing, they're showing the evil. They're showing the violence. On and on and on. There's so many other things that our country represents. But these people, based on uh, religious uh, ideology, uh, uh, affiliations, political affiliations, on and on and on, they couple themselves and they take on a mindset and their life goal, their, 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 their life, their living existence is to uh, destroy uh, 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 America. And more particularly, uh, a, 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 a democratic or democracy as we know it. Right. I mean, it's right. it's an ideology problem. It's not something that you can necessarily see. And you know, when I talk to some veterans or I talk to um, you know troops that are currently serving, it's it's very difficult. Or family members, for that matter. You know, they'll say it's very difficult for them to define the enemy because it's not um, it's not that they wear uniforms. It's it's such a um, an ingrained ideology and something yeah, that ideology. yeah right and people inhibit that it's it's something that they you know by going on social media they're inspired by and you see homegrown terror in this country I mean since 9/11 you've had 280 plus jihadist attacks uh, in this country in the U S that has been inspired online from you know radical Islamic groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. Um, and their goal not only is to have a physical caliphate, but really, you know, brainwash people. Absolutely, and it, it, it is a it, it is a, a, a an enormous task to counter to to encounter and to counter an enemy uh, that 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 you can't readily identify except by ideology. Is except the moment they begin to strike or they put put their plan together now they're they're in the implementation stage it is difficult and it is it's probably one of the more the more the more mental uh battles and mental wars that we waged as a nation because prior to uh the war on terror or terrorism we've always had a, an identifiable enemy in other words they wore a uniform that was a certain country that they were in and we could identify them by not just the ideology, but they had a, you know, had a, they, they had a, a descriptive uh, thing or place that we could identify, and that represented the enemy to us. But that doesn't exist today. Is there a solution that comes to mind for you? I mean, obviously, it's a very complicated situation, and you know, France is one of the United States, you know, biggest allies. How do you? Uh, is there any type of um, solution that comes to mind for you from your perspective? or even just an action plan that you think that the United States and France should take? Absolutely, awesome question. And to answer that question, I think it begins, in the, it begins with the direction that our president, President Trump is now approaching, uh, tighten our borders. You know, I'm, I'm con consistently and on a regular ask the question, well, what can we do about our borders? And, what, and, I, and I share with people, all we have to do is enforce the laws that are on the books. And if you go and look over the last over the, over 100 days, they said that uh, the the rate of immigration into our country has, has dropped as much as 70 percent. Right across the southern border. Go on, I apologize. No, I was just saying it's about 60 percent coming in from the southern border, which is tremendous. And you see, you know, the gang violence is being tackled as well. I mean, there are communities not far from where we are in New York. That in Long Island, on Long Island, there are uh, large groups of the MS-13 gang that have come in from El Salvador through the U.S.-Mexico border. They've been apprehended and are in the process of being deported. To me, that's common sense. I don't know why people make it a race thing um, on the left, because to me, it's common sense to enforce the law. It's common sense to get the criminal illegal aliens out of our country, no? Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I think it awesome statement. And here it is. I, my, my, my response to that is this. It should not be about race. It should not be about uh, socioeconomic status, uh, you know, finance or whatever. It should. Be, I think it goes back to and it should it, it has to go back to Neil. basic right and wrong. If it is right, call it right. If it is wrong, identify it as wrong. And I think party affiliations, race, socioeconomic status, geographical location and so many other things are causing us to misconstrue and to cloud our values, basic values. If you know it is wrong, uh, being a being a patriot, being a patriot, uh, having a love and regard for your country. And I think the challenge to me, and I and I find it kind of kind of humorous from a personal perspective, 
is a lot of times if you ha- if you don't have a comparative uh, sense of the va- uh, of the value of what you have here in the United States, you kind of take it for granted. In other words, if you've never lived outside of the country, and that's not a knock on anyone who hasn't, it simply says that there are so many places and people that don't have half of what we have, and would die. You know, there are so many people right. that that would do anything. That's why that's why the illegal immigrants are coming into this country on it, you know, on the level and 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 in the numbers that they have in the past. It's because they want something that we possess. But we we we're here as Americans and we have it and a lot of times you now, in my in my humble opinion, I believe that we take it for granted. Right. And, and right. I agree with you, especially right. when you see what I'll tell people that, you know, support Bernie Sanders, for example, well, look at Venezuela and how socialism is treating their country. You have people sifting through garbage, literally, to eat every day. And you have the, you know, the rulers in Venezuela that are taking advantage of that, and they're living like royalty. They are royalty in that nation. So you really have to take a step back and look how other people are living. And I agree with you, the reason why people are coming in is for a better life, because we do have it great here. But we also have a set of values that we have to protect. And that means that we can't just let anyone come in, especially when we have a heroin epidemic and opioids coming in through, you know, through the border and kids that are being smuggled in and sent into sex slavery. You have, you know, real concerns here. And unless you know who's coming into our country and know that they truly want a better life, you know, they should be coming in legally and we should allow them to understand the process to come into this country legally and not through illegal means. I absolutely agree. And, and what you'll discover is that when you begin, uh, my grandfather, uh, and I talk about it in the book, Life in the Second Half, uh, he reared me. He was an elderly man. Uh, my mother had me at 16 years old. And that that is the basis of the book. I talk about no matter how what your beginning is, no matter what your yesterday is, today can be a second half. But the point here is uh, daddy instilled, my grandfather instilled values. I mean, he he, he, he demanded that, you know, that you, the first thing, the, the beginning of your day was to make your bed. You didn't even go to wash your face or wash your hands, brush your teeth, any of that without first making your bed. And then you then you said your prayers and he had values, basic values. And I think a lot of what we're seeing now in our country is a washing away or going or melting away a basic value, basic respect, basic moral, basic decency. And for those that have a desire to come into our country. If they come into our country illegal, they've already violated a value. You, you come in uh, in a dishonest fashion. And my grandfather would say, and here's the point, no matter how you start, if you start off on the wrong foot, Neil, it is it is not impossible, but it's going to be difficult for you to get in the right step if you started off wrong. And that is my, 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 my plea and my challenge to those who have a desire to come into our country. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, you're welcome here. I understand your reason for desire to come here. But the only thing that we would desire is that you go about it in a legal and right fashion. That way you can be respected and protected once you arrive. Right. Because if you do it the legal way, then you're in this country, you're a citizen. You don't have to worry about deportation or any of that. But if you come in the wrong way and you make a mistake, you make, you know, commit a crime that would be preventable if we enforce our laws, you know, then then you deserve to be deported at that, you know, at that rate, that point. Um, let me ask you, because you brought up your book. What was the inspiration for the book? Was it your father? Uh, my grandfather, I would have to say. And of course, uh, my mother, by the way, happy Mother's Day, Mother's Day to my mom. Uh, but yeah, she had me at 16 years old. All the odds were against her. All the odds were against me. Uh, having been born in the South, the cradle of Confederacy, a black male, on and on and on. The statistics said that I would never make it. And I share with people all the time, how likely is it that a black male born in the Confederacy, the, com- the cradle of the South in Montgomery, Alabama, could leave Montgomery, Alabama and make it through and rise to a point to find myself from Montgomery, Alabama, all the way in Moscow, Russia. And what it says is it, it, it's not about your beginning. It's about how you complete and what you do even in the middle of the race. Which, which you know, gave me the inspiration for life in the second half, because my first half, according to the statistics, I should have lost the game. But staying in the game, I'm now talking to Neil Caruso. Isn't that good? Hey, thank you for coming on today. And 
you know, it really is an inspirational story because we always talk about on this program, hard work always pays off. And it's not about, like you said, it's not about what you are, the cards that you're dealt. It's about making the most of that and not letting that keep you down your entire life. Because at a certain point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, when you're 20, you can't be complaining about, you know, 20 years in the past. You have to look forward. What are you going to do to advance your life? Um, and given you know the upbringings, the challenges you faced, and you were able to make something tremendous of yourself, the way you served our country proudly, and now you're a pastor inspiring others down in Alabama. So we thank you for that. And you know, what's your what are your final thoughts on you know young people today and you know making something of their lives? Thank you so much for the opportunity, Neil. And uh, again, I, I simply say that. Our life is about staying in the game and not only staying in the game, but playing to win. And no matter what the last play was, you, you have to prepare for the next play. And the next play could be uh, the play to, to, to get the first down. The next play could be the play to win the game or better yet to score the touchdown. The, the, the bottom line is never give up, stay in the game. And life in the second half is available on Amazon.com. You can get it uh, on the website at www dot david k jackson dot com uh, and anywhere books are sold and we like to challenge young people especially that no matter what you uh, were born in no matter what you were born into no matter what who you were born to you can't change that but what you can change is your response to to the situation or the circumstances that you were born in and that change begins when you make up your mind i share with people that when you renew your mind you transform your life Welcome to life in the second half. And again, thank you, Neil. All right, David K. Jackson, a pleasure to have him on. Again, you can check out his book. It's davidkjackson.com for life in the second half. Pleasure to have him on. We have a busy news day today. We're going until 1.30, still to come. Remember this. Nothing worth doing ever, ever, ever came easy. Following your convictions means you must be willing to face criticism from those who lack the same courage to do what is right. And they know what is right, but they don't have the courage or the guts or the stamina to take it and to do it. It's called the road less traveled. All right, President Trump spoke at Liberty University giving a commencement speech yesterday, an inspiring message about success, and we're going to talk in the Real Deal segment about what makes a successful person and all the snowflakes obstructing. We'll get to that later in the Real Deal segment. We'll see you right after the break. Look at you. You're at the top of your game. At work or at play, you're unstoppable. Nothing can throw you off track. Oh, hey. She's cute. Nice going, man. Things are going great for you. You've earned a night out. Good drinks, good friends. Yeah, yeah. we can go ahead and call this a good night. Wait, is that your car? Uh-oh. Not smart. Yeah, I saw that coming. Say goodbye to her. Ouch. That'll hurt your bank account. You're looking at around 10 grand in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. I hope you like eating frozen dinners alone. Let's try this again. Smart move. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Crusoe Show is going to be a show all things about news and politics, and it's really an exciting time for politics. We just got out of a really heated election, and Donald Trump was elected the 45th president of the United States. So we'll be covering the Trump presidency through it all each and every week on Sundays at noon, right here from my office slash our new studio. 
and we'll be talking uh, about everything that, you know, and analyzing Trump's plans and, and talking about how things are shaping up for the country. I really love the United States. I really love this country. And I want to make sure that we truly do make America great because if Donald Trump succeeds, then the whole country succeeds. Which Obama said, and we need to come together as a country, and hopefully uh, this show can make some sort of impact, and you really want to make a difference here. My goal for this show is also to create dialogue, because too often people hide behind a computer or a cell phone, and they really don't connect with people. Um, they, only, they only talk to people they agree with, and if you're a conservative, you're considered a racist, that ends the conversation. Um, believe me, I've been there. So what I want to do here, going forward, is to create dialogue and to have a conversation. So people are going to be able to call in, want to have a wholesome conversation and really create dialogue that could make some sort of difference in the community. And I think if we just talk together, and if we just have conversations about things without making accusations that are nonsense, we could really do some good in the United States. So that's what my goal for the new Lake Cruiser show is. And I hope you tune in on Sunday. It's time to open the dialogue, grab a cup of coffee, and chat with Neil A. Caruso via Skype. All right, we're back on the Neil A. Caruso Show. We go until 1.30 today. Happy Mother's Day to everyone out there. Um, so what we did in the first segment really told you all that we need to get into about James Comey, but that doesn't affect you. You know, it's funny because NBC News released a poll saying that only about, what, 20% even care or something like that. Something like that. Some poll. I don't even know if it's true. Uh, because they've been pushing a false narrative. But the, the thing is that people don't care about that. Ultimately, they care about their finances. They care about what affects them. Uh, so let's talk about things that affect you, including health care. This week we found out that Aetna is the latest insurance company to pull out of insurance markets of the Obamacare exchange in 2018, a total of rebuke of everything that Obamacare was supposedly meant to be. Um, take a look at the Health Care um, Act that was put forth by the House as the amendment to the American Health Care Act that um, allows uh, states more control and gets the free market in there. Now, you know I've been critical of the Health Care Act the House put forth. It was a big win a couple of weeks ago. Uh, those are some of the details, removing the Obamacare mandate and, and covering um, uh, costs um, and really trying to lower premiums and deductibles because we've seen increases of about 38% in Texas and 116% in Arizona. It's a big one, um, about 9% in uh, Oklahoma and increases throughout the country and just premiums. And the deductibles are very high that you can't use it. So people care about when are we getting this health care act on the road. Now, it took a long time for Obamacare to pass through the Senate. What they're saying this week is that it could, um, you know, it's going to take a while to go through the Senate, that they very well could be marking up this bill and possibly get a very different bill than what you saw in the House. Now, no doubt is that a win for House Republicans and for the president. But now we need to get this Health Care Act in there because Americans are struggling. And we know, I mean, I talked to someone the other day who told me that her rates went through the roof um, for premiums and deductibles. Her parents cannot see the doctor of their choice. Um, you know, if you like your doctor, you keep your doctor and all that. So health care needs to be dealt with and needs to be dealt with quickly. What we're seeing the past well, over 100 days in the Trump administration that he works very fast, and he works faster than anyone else. And while everyone is looking at the James Comey situation over here, President Trump is focused on his agenda to cut taxes and get rid of um, Obamacare and replace it with something else. Now, of course, the Health Care Act, it is something that is um, an entitlement now that people think they're entitled to health insurance, and that's really where conservatives differ on where you know healthcare plays in the role in the role of Americans. Uh, but if you're going to replace it, it needs to lower costs. Senator Rand Paul, who we mentioned earlier in the unmasking situation, uh, is a doctor who wants to propose something a little bit more conservative to reduce the cost of your health care. But that's tied into tax reform. Because what President Trump wants to do on taxes 
is to cut it across the board and really reform the system. So not just cut taxes, but actually have reform that we haven't seen since 1986 under President Ronald Reagan. Now, the reform would include um, not only cutting taxes on the personal side, it would uh, reduce the number of tax brackets and simplify the $4 million tax code. It would also eliminate the standard, uh, not the standard deduction, some of the other deductions, or most standard, uh, deductions besides the standard deduction uh, that the, the wealthy. Um, in fact, Senator Schumer said that uh, they are ready now. Democrats are all of a sudden they're ready to, um, to come together with uh, Republicans and uh, come up with some sort of health care bill. But I'm a little skeptic, uh, you know, a little wary of that uh, when Schumer says all of a sudden we're ready because they want ultimately a single, single payer system. It's not going to work. Now, Schumer says that this taxes the rich. Um, and, well, it really doesn't because when you look at this, it actually cuts the taxes for the middle class, but Democrats consider the rich. Well, you're rich if you make $75,000. Is that enough to put your kids through college? I don't think so. So when you have Democrats saying, well, you're wealthy, you make $75,000, you know, we just got out of taxis and you paid your taxes, uh, that's just not fair. Um, so what I see between the two parties, I see a lot of disconnect of the American people, and you have a president who wants to put in tax reform and put in tax reform uh, for all Americans. And really, um, he ultimately is going to tax the wealthy more, but he's going to take care of the middle class that we haven't seen in middle class. Um, and that's why so many people voted for President Trump. That's why you saw the blue-collar Americans in places like uh, Pittsburgh and the steel workers and uh, the coal uh, country as well going for Trump. And well, President Trump, you look at his accomplishments through over 100 days, while everyone, again, is looking over here at the Comey situation, President Trump is getting action done. He's cutting uh, EPA regulations, uh, allowing minors to get back to work, and you've seen the jobs coming. I mean, look at the big league jobs here. Uh, all of this coming in since President Trump was elected because he promised a low corporate tax rate of 15% and a repatriation rate probably of about 10% to bring back about $2 trillion and is stored offshore. And these companies are now investing in manufacturing, and the manufacturing jobs have come back, and they come back bigly. And we saw uh, just yesterday a stack came out about the budget surplus. $182 billion budget surplus in April. So think of that. After, you know, we have almost $20 trillion in debt, President Barack Obama added more debt than all 43 presidents before him combined on the American economy. We've seen a 2.1% uh, struggling GD of GDP growth that should be about 3 4%. If we get health care done for you so that your costs are lowered, we get tax reform in there, you're going to see investments in this country like, well, frankly, we haven't seen since the 80s. And manufacturing has come back. And then also, you're seeing surpluses now in the budget. Uh, so we need to lower the deficit and get the burden off of, you know, your grandkids and the future uh, of America. And that's why when you look at health care and you look at the health savings accounts, that would be very beneficial for the millennial generation who can invest their money in their health care. Uh, we're looking at um, a better policy. There's a lot of obstructionists uh, in Honestly, on the left, and you really see how politics have played firsthand. You know, we always talk about, well, President Trump has, and I say it a lot, President Trump has been really good for politics because people are finally paying attention to politics and policy for the first time. Do you think we would be talking about comprehensive tax reform or sanctuary cities or health care? Uh, would we be talking about recusal and all these archaic uh, nuclear option rules in, uh, in the Senate? No, probably not. Because if we, if we had Hillary Clinton, well, people would go back and not pay attention. President Trump has been great for this country in, in many areas, but one area, getting people to actually look at policy and look at what's good for them, for their wallets, and for their families. And hopefully, we get this Trump agenda in there. It'll benefit you, the American people. Now, when we come back, like I mentioned, there are a lot of obstructionists, and, well, 
They just don't get it. But President Trump spoke at Liberty University yesterday. Here's what he had to say. So when we come back, the difference between successful people and snowflakes. That's when we come back in the Real Deal segment. We take it till 1.30 on this Mother's Day. Are you looking to reach more customers in an efficient and inspiring way? Looking to take your business to the next level? NextCore Media is your one-stop digital and internet solution. We help you create your website, optimize for search engines and social media, and even produce original content for your business with our outstanding production team. The best part is, we manage all of it for you, so you don't have to worry about one thing. Start making your modern business solutions today. Visit nextcoremedia.com and get started. L.A. Crusoe tells you what you need to know. Opening up the dialogue. Straightforward talk. That drives the political establishment crazy. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor. Period. What, like with a cloth or something? I don't know how it works digitally at all. <laughs> He's got the knack for it. The knack for America. Subscribe to the Neil A. Caruso Show podcast on iTunes and log on to neilacaruso.com. We're going to win so much, you may even get tired of winning. And you'll say, please, please, it's too much winning. Hey, Gabby, how you doing? How's the play date and sleepover? Dad, it was great. Awesome. Okay, I'm on my way. Hey, guys, what are you doing? We're going swimming. We're going biking. Yeah. I'll see you in a little bit, guys. I love you. Hi, babe. How was school today? Hi, Dad. It was great. Okay, honey. I'll be home soon. Remember, you're never too far away from your kids to be a dad. Reach out and take a second to check in. Because sometimes the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Everywhere that we go, he makes people laugh and makes people smile, and I feel like I have that quality. He's the one who always takes me fishing. Neil's the real deal. Time for the real deal with Neil. All right, time for the real deal segment as we wrap things up on this Mother's Day. Well, the difference between a successful person and a snowflake, an obstructionist that are, frankly, loser. Well, that's the segment for real deal today. Now, you may know I am actually graduating a week from today. And President Trump gave a commencement speech. Well, I felt like it was my commencement speech. He gave a commencement speech yesterday to students at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. I've seen so many brilliant people. They gave up in life. They were totally brilliant. They were top of their class. They were the best students. They were the best of everything. They gave up. I've seen others who really didn't have that talent or that ability. And they're among the most successful people today in the world because they never quit and they never gave up. So just remember that. Never stop fighting for what you believe in and for the people who care about you. Carry yourself with dignity and pride. Demand the best from yourself and be totally unafraid to challenge entrenched interests and failed power structures. Does that sound familiar, by the way? The more people tell you it's not possible, that it can't be done, the more you should be absolutely determined to prove them wrong. Treat the word impossible as nothing more than motivation. Relish the opportunity to be an outsider. Embrace that label. Being an outsider is fine. Embrace the label. 
because it's the outsiders who change the world and who make a real and lasting difference. So President Trump giving the commencement address to students at Liberty University in Virginia yesterday. And well, we just actually got breaking news, speaking of snowflakes, Chuck Schumer saying they're going to refuse to put in whoever President Trump nominates as an FBI director. A lot of rumors out there. They're going to refuse unless he totally gets out of this Russia investigation, which he's not in this Russia investigation, which we went over in the first time. But see, Chuck Schumer, as Trump calls crying Chuck Schumer, uh, people like that, well, they're, they just whine about everything. And it extends to school. So you look at, like, Georgetown, for instance. You know, they have a resistance course, okay, that calling President Trump uh, sexist, misogynist, right, every name in the book, as you know, uh, that they call conservatives. And, well, they actually are offering this course to teach people how bad President Trump is. You have a teacher, a Spanish teacher in a Colorado high school hitting a pinata um, in another instance where uh, you just have a total, um, you know, madness, where and this teacher was actually uh, expelled uh, from, the, from the school. And there you see it. They put a picture of Trump on a pinata, and she's, well, they're hitting. Um, there's also a thing called, apparently, uh, P privilege, uh, which uh, means, I guess, something about transgender um, uh, bathroom access. Uh, and then, of course, the UC Berkeley riots, where they set the campus on fire, uh, and you just had total um, madness and anarchy. And this is college campuses across the nation, where they just can't accept someone of a different viewpoint. And then you also have a snowflake losing it over seeing a Trump sign on a campus. This is real. This is a real scream because she saw a Trump sign. And then you also have, well, an Instagram post, some millennial uh, writing bragging about how she got a 1.0 free GPA, but I guess she feels she's looking good. Wasting all that money to go to school and you just have a 1.03 GPA and you're bragging about it. And then you have cry-ins after the election and all the crying and whining because, well, Hillary Clinton didn't win and President Trump won and they're consoling each other and having hot chocolate. Okay, so what does this all mean? This means that there are certain people, okay, that just have a mentality that they blame others for everything, for all their hardships in life. And what President Trump's message was that you can't achieve anything without working hard, without dreaming big and thinking big. There are other stories, too. I saw a North Carolina high school actually recalled all their yearbooks um, because somebody used a Trump quote, build the wall in their yearbook. And all they thought that was so insensitive. So we're going to um, we're going to recall it because there was Facebook outrage calling of the student a racist. Um, I hope they don't take. Uh, our recalling our yearbooks because I use a Trump quote as well about thinking big and about nothing being impossible. Uh, Texas Southern University, they shut down uh, Senator John Cornyn's commencement speech because there was an online petition by students who didn't want to hear a conservative. This type of mentality is dangerous. This type of mentality of obstructionist, well, it's just going to prevent the country from winning. Um, and, you know, President Trump uh, is working so hard. And he has a very ambitious agenda that, would, if people paid attention to it, would benefit Americans. Now, you don't have to agree with him on everything. I'm not saying you do. But at this point, after 100 days, you would think people would just give him a chance. You know, the media hasn't gone over it. Um, the snowflakes at college campuses, well, they're just crying about it still. You're not going to change it. You know, the only thing you can change is your destiny by working hard, by putting in the work. And that's what President Trump's message was. That basically, if you work hard, if you put in the time, if you think big, you shouldn't think less of yourself or think that you can't achieve something because someone tells you you can't do it. He said impossible is should be a motivational tool. And I truly believe that, and that's been a big theme of our program here, that you need to be able to think big. And that's the only way you're going to accomplish and achieve anything in life. For, so for all those naysayers, all those snowflakes who are crying and you know you see the images and you see almost every single week there are stories uh from college campuses of people whining and complaining well and you also have politicians doing it i mean even uh, senator elizabeth warren you know, pocahontas who said that um you know no one is above the law took a shot at trump 
Well, if people weren't above the law, we wouldn't have a two-tier justice system that makes one rules for one set of rules for the Clintons and another for other Americans. I think people have had it. I think regular Americans, people in you know blue-collar um, uh, rural countries, um, aspects of this nation, they get that um, there is uh, there there needs to be um, a little bit of tough talking. You know, when we're dealing with um, uh, situations in North Korea and China, and you have people that want to kill us, and radical ideology that we talked about with David K. Jackson earlier, um, in terms of France and terrorism, there needs to be a change. There needs to be that we come together as a country and stop beating each other up, because we will never succeed as a country unless people actually come together. And frankly, there's too much partisanship. Donald Trump is not an ideal law. Really never has been started out as a Democrat in New York City of all places. You know, very liberal city, okay, and now, you know, ran for the Republican nomination. He's not an ideal law. I think people need to come and meet him halfway. You don't have to agree on everything, but here's the deal. In terms of you and your personal, um, you know, well-being, you're not going to, by crying and complaining that there's a Trump sign, what is that going to do for your career and your life? What is that going to do for your children? If you want to be politically active, great. Not everyone has to be politically involved and as you know, involved as uh, as a senator on Capitol Hill. But pay attention to what's going on in the world. Make your own assessments for yourself. Don't be caught up in group thing that people who are having these huggings and that are whining because President Trump won. Well, you know, think about your future and the future of Americans. Um, former President Barack Obama spoke in Italy the other day and gave a speech about communism and that, you know, and I guess praising communism in some aspect in Italy. Um, communism, the whole, the whole um, reason why that is wrong is because you're just taking from people who are successful. Um, like we talked about in the last segment, um, you know, taxing uh, people because they've achieved success is not a recipe for winning. That's a recipe for losing. Okay, because you want to encourage people to have these big dreams and invent and come up with ways to make the world better in whatever field that they're doing and whatever field that they're involved. Uh, by taxing people who achieve success, by pointing them out as bad people, and by saying that we're just going to take from those people and we're going to have a communist regime, that just doesn't work. And that leads to losing, that leads to a country that is really just pessimistic. So things have to change, you know, and that's why I mentioned Venezuela and that interview David K. Jackson earlier. Things have to change. Things have to get forward to where we applaud success, where we say, you know, people who work hard, you know, I have a great team here at Caruso Enterprises. Christian Ladagoski on the other side of the camera and Nick Hintz do a tremendous job here for getting together the show. I know they were up late last night because we have a lot of content today. And you know what, though? They're going to be successful because they worked hard and because they want to do something with their lives other than cry and complain about an election. You don't have to agree with President Trump. You don't have to agree with me. Um, that's the whole point of free speech. You have to let other people speak and have productive dialogue. It's really the whole crux of our show, and that's why we spent a lot of time today, an hour and a half, in fact, to go over a lot of the misinformation that is out there. So the difference between being successful in the snowflake is hard work. And that will always lead to success. I want to give a Mother's Day shout out. Happy Mother's Day to all the loving mothers out there. A really happy Mother's Day to my mom, who has been a bedrock of support for me. And I want to thank her for everything that she has done to support uh, myself and my sister. Thank you, Mom. And uh, thank you, baby. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Enjoy your Mother's Day. And we will talk to you soon. No show next week as I am walking down the aisle for graduation. But we will see you soon enough. Have a good one. Stay classy. God bless you. God bless you.